Hi everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. Once again, we have the pleasure of having, uh, for the third time, Dr. James McGrath of Butler University to talk with us about his new book, Theology and Science Fiction. And uh, to help me do that is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. How's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good, and, and thanks for asking. It is quite cold in Montreal. Yes, but, we, uh, our, who our knows viewers are riveted. <laughs> they, they've been waiting to hear that. Also, by next show, I should have a tooth. So All big, right. big change is coming for people who don't <laughs> listen to this as a podcast and watch it as a video. Yes, Canadian healthcare comes through at last. Yeah. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. Hello, Dr. McGrath. Thank you for once again joining us on Talk Gnosis. Oh, it's my pleasure, and I understand that uh, I'm actually entering quite uncharted territory, uh, yeah. having been invited back yet again. Yeah, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Neither do I, so <laughs> this should be fun. All right, well, why don't you tell us then about your new book? Uh, I'm sure it will be of interest to many of our listeners and viewers, Theology and Science Fiction. What is it all about, and why did you write it? Uh, well, there are short answers and long answers to most questions about uh, religion, Gnosticism, science fiction. Uh, the short answer to what it's all about is that's about theology and science fiction. <laughs> uh, as to why I wrote it, uh, and I'll get back to a longer answer about the content as well. Uh, the short answer as to why I wrote it was that I got an invitation to uh, contribute this volume to the Cascade Companion series, which is a series of short introductions. Uh, if you've seen, for instance, Oxford's series of very short introductions or... Um, a Guide for the Perplexed is another one of those series. So this is sort of a series like that that tries to condense the key ideas about a particular topic or explore a topic in a way that's accessible to a beginning student, an interested layperson. And the reason, the longer answer, the reason why I was so excited to get this invitation is that I had edited a volume on religion and science fiction. I had contributed essays to or edited or co-edited other volumes about the intersection of religion and science fiction. This would be my first time putting my own thoughts and just my own thoughts in a book length treatment. Now that said, I suppose I should hold up the book and show that it's it's a fairly thin book length treatment. Mm -hmm. um, most, most people will probably say that's a good thing. <laughs> but Still, it would be my chance to go into more depth about my own thoughts and not just uh, sort of set my ideas side by side with those of others. And also a chance to uh, take a theological approach. Uh, it's a non-sectarian kind of theological approach. It's trying to engage theology in its broadest sense and in a way that interacts across theological traditions. But nonetheless, to be theological in the sense of providing a guide to people who want to formulate their own ideas about religion and theology and science fiction and their intersection, uh, and their intersection with philosophy and ethics and other things, uh, the practical application thereof, and not just to get information about people think this, this show has these themes. And so trying to explore it in that sort of way. Uh, the volume in addition to the kind of academic writing that I usually do, also contains a few short science fiction stories that I wrote. And so that's another reason I was really excited about this. Uh, last year was uh, a branching out for me into another genre, uh, in fact, more than one genre. Uh, but one of them was writing science fiction myself and not just writing about science fiction that others had written. And so my first sci-fi short story was published last year in an anthology about the intersection of religion and spaceflight. Uh, the volume's called Touching the Face of the Cosmos. And then in this volume, Theology and Science Fiction, I published a few more short stories. Um, one of which I, I, it was an idea that I'd had for a long time, and so I seized this opportunity uh, to do something with a couple of stories that I'd written earlier, but also to finally get around to writing a story that uh, well, it features time travel to first century Judea. Let's put it that way. And uh, you might guess where it goes from there. <laughs> um, the, the, Dr. McGrath, how do you define science fiction? Just to kind of lay the groundwork for how we can connect it to, to religion, theology, and Gnosticism. Like, what is, what is science fiction? Uh, that's a great question. It's one of the things I have to tackle early in a course I teach on religion, science fiction at Butler University. 
it's also something that I tackle but then quickly set aside in a lot of ways because uh, like religion, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that actually when you try to pin it down can be awkward. But for seeing this question, I actually pulled up, I remember seeing a, a blog post that uh, Paul Levinson, uh, who's himself a sci-fi author and uh, one of the co-editors of that volume I mentioned, uh, but he had written a post recently in which he essentially tried to delineate the difference between fantasy and science fiction. Mm -hmm. So let me know what you think of this. Okay. If you, he, and I'm quoting him, if you click your heels together three times and say there's no place like home, and that gets you across the universe, that's fantasy. Okay. If you click your heels together three times and the spark that results touches a vulnerable spot in the space-time continuum that causes a wormhole to open and you travel across the universe that way, that's science fiction. <laughs> okay, that works. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Now, you know, one of the things, you know, I sometimes have students who show up in a class about religion, science fiction, and ask, you know, are we going to talk about Lord of the Rings or things like that? Uh, and so we, we tackle this early on. Uh, and you the answer, point, the answer you to that point question. them towards the geology for, for jocks class down the hall, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell the short answer is no, but I do explain why, right? And it is possible to delineate science fiction from fantasy, but mm -hmm. not in a way that avoids blurriness and avoids overlap, mm -hmm. right? So, for instance, there are some examples of uh, attempts to really do hard science fiction. Um, David Brin, for instance, mm -hmm. is a futurist as well as a sci-fi author, and um, he has this rather uh, monumental tome, um, Existence, which is a, a fascinating uh, novel in its own right. But it's trying very hard to stick with things that are scientifically plausible. So there's no warp drive, and in fact, that is part of the story. Um, <laughs> but if you look at something like well, we can move up from there to Star Trek, and a lot of people would say, well, that's hard sci-fi, but we don't know that warp drive will work, and dilithium crystals are, yeah. <laughs> how are they different from kyber crystals in Star Wars, <laughs> where you're already you have this spiritual thing, the Force, and they're midi-chlorians, you know, but most fans <laughs> are not really happy about the fact, you know. And so, is it mysticism? Is it science? Is it both? And then you get to Doctor Who, which is, <laughs> you know, I'm a big fan of Doctor Who, but you could tell the exact same stories. I say this anytime this question comes up. You could tell the exact same stories about a wizard mm -hmm. with a magical box. And, you know, the monsters are the same. They may not be from other planets. But, you know, how is the TARDIS different from magic? Yeah, and the, the, short the answer wardrobe is, in Narnia or something. Right. And the short answer is it's, it's not. And that in itself, I think, is interesting as we explore the intersection of theology and science fiction. Right? Because why do people take magic and turn it into science fiction? Why do they take monsters and move them from fantasy into um, the realm of the supposedly scientific? Not necessarily the actually scientifically plausible, mm -hmm. but the quasi-scientific, the um, you know, s surface level scientific jargon. Uh, one of the interesting facts I loved learning about Star Trek was that, you know, script writers, when they needed that techno babble, sometimes they would just put tech in the script <laughs> and then pass it off to someone to say, you know, the the flux capacitator or the dilithium crystals and the, you know, are opening a, a, a warp in the space-time continuum due to the quantum effects of uh, Einsteinian neo-gravitational, <laughs> you know, and it can go on from there. But it's starting to sound like a magical incantation already, you know, if you aren't familiar with the jargon. And if you are, it's probably sounding even less like science, you know. So, so what right, is there. the... You know, what, <laughs> I, I might be jumping a little bit ahead here, but the, these um, kind of hand-waving science-y jargon words on the one hand and the hand-waving magic-y... Um, words of uh, fantasy or, dare I say, many religious texts, um, there seems to be a, a need to, or it, as, a, as a storytelling trope, right, that mm -hmm. these things come up again and again, um, what are the, what would you see as the common kind of sci-fi tropes that uh, apply most directly to religion? 
Uh, well, I think it would be interesting maybe to segue from what we were just talking about and to notice the difference between religion and fantasy and okay. religion and science fiction. Sure, yeah, yeah. And of course, there's a wide array. And so it all depends on the imagination of the author, ultimately, and their own worldview. And uh, sometimes their ability to write persuasive characters, maybe who don't share their worldview, uh, because there are some stories, for instance, by atheist authors that have really compelling religious characters, and there are some that have you know, real caricatures, um, and that's kind of the point. But you know, if you play something like Dungeons and Dragons, right? Religion works, right? You get to roll the dice and heal someone or cast a fireball or a magic missile. Um, and so, you know, uh, in fact, one of the most interesting uh, seminars that I went to at Gen Con one year, um, one of the nice things living in Indianapolis is I have easy access to Gen Con, mm -hmm. um, no real travel involved. But there was one that was uh, put on by um, an ordained minister um, in a fairly small denomination, but uh, an ordained minister who also was a, an avid gamer. And he looked at the dynamics of religion in sort of fantasy world creation and game world creation. And you know, asked about, you know, how does this work and why does it work this way in games versus the way it works in the real world, right? So what would happen if, you know, every Catholic priest was able to cast a fireball spell? That would be and awesome. What happens if you right. become a Lutheran? Right? And you lose the ability then, right? What happens if you break with the church, but you can still keep the ability? What does that do to the papal authority and things like that? You know, and you know, all this, all this, these kinds of questions that never come up in real religion because, um, well, um, I don't know your church intricately, but I assume that your tradition and mine share that uh, neither of us goes around casting fireball. No, but it is interesting that you um, there are certain powers of the priesthood, right, that um, are conferred upon ordination that are irrevocable, right? The the ability to transubstantiate the host and all that stuff. You know, if you if you take a um, more secular view, that could be viewed as a magical act, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and and those kinds of things have been debated by theologians for. Uh, centuries do you do you retain those powers if you're no longer acting as a priest so this example is actually more literal than you may think right we, we should find we should find this uh this presenter and be like well you know if they quit the roman catholic church do they still have the magic power of transubstantiation which of course is a you know an actual debate that is in yep. the the wider catholic world and goes back to what tertullian or something mm -hmm. um but, uh, yeah. however, that said, uh, uh, although I, I do love the miracle of transubstantiation, the miracle of literal fireballs. Yes, that would be <laughs> way cooler. Yeah. Yeah, and if we think about transubstantiation then and say what would happen if you, you have that in a science fiction show, yeah. you might have someone debunking it and you know, do, taking, taking the host into the lab and saying, look, see, it's not, you know. Yeah. Um, or you might have the doctor discovering that Wow, something's going on here, and then you know, turns out that uh, it's a, you know, the the churches have consistently been built in places that were marked out as sacred space because uh, meteorites previously fell there, which uh, had this effect of you know, and so yeah. there's something quasi scientific, yeah. not again, not actually scientific, but something that's supposed to be a scientific explanation for the thing, and what's interesting. Right? And this is where I think it really gets interesting, you know, thinking about religion and science fiction. It might offer a quasi-scientific explanation for what you see, but in the process it might also say that the thing that religion historically said is actually literally true, literally happening. Right. Right? So, for instance, the crew of the Enterprise encounter Apollo, right? Famous example. Mm -hmm. And... On the one hand, Captain Kirk is adamant, Apollo's no god, but he might have been mistaken for one once. Right? To, I think I'm quoting him exactly there. And that's Captain Kirk being a theologian, because how do you decide if someone's a god or not? Right? <laughs> we'll come back yeah. to that, I hope. But that's one of the great things that you can ask in science fiction, right? looking at our real universe, imagining visiting other worlds. How what do you know what's found with a god? spaceship? Yeah, and what does God need with a spaceship is also a great question that Star Trek, uh, Star Trek <laughs> franchise asks. Um, yeah, and one of my 
recent uh, publications outside of this volume that I wrote recently is to the um, ultimate Star Trek and philosophy, right, for the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. It explores uh, Gene Roddenberry's uh, humanist theology, right? So it's a sort of secular humanist theology, which I think is very interesting. Mm -hmm. But Apollo in the Star Trek universe literally exists and is a powerful being. Most people on Earth in the present day who study Greek mythology would not take any story about Apollo as literally as Star Trek does. And so is it saying that these stories are literally true, or is it debunking them by (laughs) moving them into this science fictional realm? And so there's this fascinating aspect to it that I just, um, you know, it continues to, you know, amaze me. So I, I want to clarify for uh, just just make sure I get your point, and for any audience members who haven't seen that episode, but chances are they all have because there's a pretty <laughs> big overlap between sci-fi fantasy right. fans in our audience. So can we so just tell them that the, it's unacceptable if they've never seen it? Yeah, and they should go out and rectify that, and then come back and watch the rest of this. Or uh, oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah, sure, yeah. Right. so pause yeah. pause this right now. Go out. Watch Is it on episode. Netflix? Let's let's Enjoy. see. <laughs> So, so, so they, uh, so, um, the Star Trek Enterprise encounters an alien that calls itself Apollo, that has all the powers of Apollo, all the traditional appearances of Apollo, and went to Earth thousands of years ago, where the ancient Greeks thought it was the, the Greek god Apollo, right? But <laughs> Stargate. <it's, clears throat> yeah. <laughs> and so, so the Star Trek Enterprise crew is saying, oh, it's actually an alien, but in some ways that's more... That's as literal as the ancient Greeks because they're encountering. Mm-hmm. They may they may be you know saying that oh this is an alien, but it it has the exact description of Apollo. So am I right in that? And in some ways, it's kind of um, even more validating than than hand waving it away and saying it's magic. Well, yeah. On the one hand, I think traditionally religion has sometimes felt you know particular kinds of religion, particular approaches to religion have felt threatened by scientific explanation. Not all religions, not all theological traditions within any given religion view scientific explanation that way, but some do, right? And so, I mean, to, to take another tradition that actually exists today, and so maybe will be more, you know, you know more uh, relatable in that way, if it turned out that the God of ancient Israel was, in fact, an alien visitor, who came down and parted the the sea and spoke to Moses, and you know these these um, alien spacecraft have a tendency to look like a burning bush or something, you know, I don't, you know, so whatever, and actually parted the sea and freed the Israelites from slavery and did all these things that the story says. Which, if you ask a historian, they might be much more skeptical, right? Right. But right. it turns out that aliens did it. Right? I'm not. I'll hold up my hand and say, I'm not saying it was aliens, <laughs> but it was aliens. Oh, that's getting the Photoshop. Unfortunately, I don't have the hair. but No, um, no, you will in post. Don't worry. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, if you can edit that <laughs> yeah, in, that would be perfect. But, um, yeah, in fact, I can even mess up my hair, and it still doesn't have the same effect because I don't have enough of it, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> at moments like this. But So here's the question. If an alien did that for your people, should you still celebrate Passover? Why or why not? Yeah, interesting questions. Uh, you know, like, would, what is a god <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Yeah. And it's precisely the chance to ask that question, right? Mm-hmm. Is, is Q on Star Trek a god, right? Mm-hmm. Not the god, right? He's not all-powerful, but what does he lack that divinities, right, with, you know, the gods, plural, lowercase g in English, have right if anything hmm. uh, is the force god why or why not right? uh, what makes what makes a, a being a god what makes you know what what defines divinity and why is it there's also the question related question why does science fiction enjoy populating its universes with powerful beings that at least traditionally would have been called gods right hmm. and so the very fact that science fiction provides an opportunity to ask those questions which are, at their heart, theological questions, is one of the reasons why I think there is, in fact, a, not just an intersection, but a significant overlap between theology and science fiction in the present day. Mm-hmm. 
we're going to come back to a lot of that stuff <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. further on because there's a ton to unpack there. Um, <clears throat> let's let's take a little bit of a left turn though in uh, for the moment. What uh, we're, let's talk about religious literacy that's been coming up a lot lately um, in in the news and whatnot. Uh, it seems that uh, people are less and less. Uh, religiously literate or maybe less willing to engage in uh, in religious literacy than they have been in the past. Um, in your classes, um, what kind of sci-fi uh, stories and things do you use to illustrate religious points for people who may be uh, un unwilling or maybe just unable to, uh, to approach some of these uh, religious topics? Uh well, I've, I've debated every semester I've taught the course what works to include and what to leave out and how to navigate the fact that when it comes to things that aren't written stories, you really uh, you have this abundance that some people may be familiar with, but not everyone. And so do I assign viewing as well as reading? Mm. And what I've tended to do is, uh, in the past, I've always had a a longer novel, and there are a number of novels that I think are really good for exploring uh, the intersection of religion, sci-fi, and theology and sci-fi, um, ranging from you know Carl Sagan's Contact, but there you know people just go out and watch the movie. <laughs> um, Mary Doria Russell wrote a pair of novels uh, called The Sparrow and Children of God, which are really fantastic. Uh, Robert J. Sawyer has a novel, Calculating God, which I used a while back, and then uh, Margaret Atwood doesn't like to be categorized as science fiction, but her recent Mad Adam trilogy really deserves to be called science fiction. I mean, it's dystopian fiction, which is what she's happier having her literature categorized as. But it really is about the near future of science and genetic engineering and uh, the potential for uh, genetic engineering pharmaceutical companies to bring about essentially a, you know, a, a catastrophe. And she creates a fictional religion for the that no, novel series and the second novel actually has uh, it has a, a religious allusion in the title the year of the flood and it features hymns of this fictitious religious group right sort of every chapter is introduced by the words to one of their hymns and so religion you know fictional religion is woven into this science fiction dystopian fiction work um, but in terms of short stories, um, I mean, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Isaac Asimov, Ray Bradbury, uh, so many people have explored religious themes, sometimes sympathetically, sometimes satirically, uh, sometimes both. And so there really is an abundance. And I think the things that we mentioned earlier, as well as some of the things that we we bracketed out to come back to or uh, did quick left turns to avoid getting too entangled <laughs> in them too early in the show. Got to give something, the some the people something to look forward to, you know? Yeah, but illustrate the fact that uh, there really is a lot of intersection overlap. And if we go back to what is arguably the first work of science fiction in the modern sense, um, and I'd have to say at that point there's there's an unbroken tradition of storytelling that goes back even earlier, but it, when we get into the scientific era, as defined today, then we get to get we get to science fiction in the strict sense. And what's often regarded as the first such work is Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle of that is A Modern Prometheus. And mm -hmm. of course, Prometheus is one of the Greek gods. And the story is about scientists who plays God, right? that's the, the way the theme is usually summed up, and that's a major theme throughout science fiction. And so the question of humanity and divinity and is there a boundary between the two, right? That's what the Prometheus story is about, and that's what the Shelley story is about, and that's what a lot of science fiction is about. And there's actually an unbroken tradition that goes back into antiquity and religious literature from antiquity and traces directly into science fiction from the beginning. Mm. Mm. So, um, kind of uh, moving into, uh, and again, we'll have a lot to unpack later, but uh, kind of getting specifically in, into Gnosticism. So, uh, uh, you know, early Christianity is quite diverse. Uh, the Gnostic Christians 
um, you know, the Sepians and the Valentinians were, were, were groups among many in a, in a rich, very tapestry of early Christianity. But I, I see a lot of Gnostic themes and science fiction writers and filmmakers and TV show uh, uh, runners drawing upon Gnosticism. But I don't notice them, you know, drawing from other se obscure second century um, uh, heresies. So is, is there something about Gnosticism that goes particularly well with science fiction? Is there a reason why, like, a lot of famous sci-fi works uh, look back to Gnosticism for inspiration as opposed to other obscure heresies? Is there something particularly sci-fi about it? Uh, potentially. Uh, in one sense, anything that gives you visitors from from beyond uh, can can be woven into science fiction, and we see that in you know there's a a brief outburst at some point of Stargate, which <laughs> of course uh, fits that category. Uh, but another thing that's a common trope in science fiction is the savior figure, right? Mm -hmm. And when you get uh, when you get into science and science fiction and their intersection, exploring big questions like, do we save ourselves? Do we need some beings from elsewhere to save us? Uh, why do we need salvation? Uh, what's wrong with the world? Uh, is it our fault? Is it the fault of aliens? Is the world made this way? Is the world maybe made by some bungling scientist in a lab who sparks a big bang, which then creates a universe? And the way universes are born and end up as terrible as they are is that scientists, eventually every universe evolves beings who decide to build you know, um, a bigger and bigger particle accelerator until they uh, destroy their own universe and give birth to another one, right? And what you're getting to there, for instance, is the idea that a universe could come about due to the action of some inferior being, right? some bungling, incompetent scientist, or maybe some really exalted but nonetheless fallible uh, alien intelligence. And Gnosticism nowadays gets used in a broad sense as well as in a narrow sense, but the classic Gnosticism of antiquity, and that which is still preserved in groups like the Mandeans that have survived down to the pre present day, Make a distinction between the creator of the world that we inhabit, who is you know, either a malevolent figure or at best a, a fallible figure, and the supreme god, the supreme divine reality, which is beyond that and is superior. And the aim is to escape from the present world eventually and to ascend to that, that better world, which is actually uh, we have some kind of inherent connection to it and you know, we really belong there. Yeah. And so whether it's scientists doing this by accident, or whether it's uh, creating an, uh, a virtual reality, a simulation of a world, you know, the potential for us to become creators and to make something that is maybe good, but not perfect, because we're not perfect, gets at that whole theme of the possibility that the world is imperfect because its creator is imperfect. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the reasons. But I think, that, I think there are multiple reasons why uh, Gnosticism you know, keeps showing up. And sometimes it's conscious. And sometimes I think it may just uh, be something that's in you know, the, 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 the spirit of the age when a particular work is created. And then in some cases, you have someone like Philip K. Dick having you know, what they believe are spiritual encounters with um, you know, the Gnostic tradition and Gnostic entities and experiencing revelation so that, you know, in his case, you know, there's a very specific reason why he's writing <laughs> Gnostic science fiction. And yeah. I don't think that explanation applies to most others who fit into that category. No. Yeah. No, that might, might just be him uniquely. <laughs> um, that, does, that does lead to the, to the next question. What, what sci-fi works do seem the most gnostic -y to you, either deliberately or happen to kind of pick up on the, the same themes? Uh, well, yeah, Philip K. Dick's novels right, go to the top of the list just mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, he's, he, he basically was not just a Gnostic, but more specifically a Valentinian theologian of yeah. the modern era. Um, and it's, it's fascinating. And 
there's a sense in which science fiction is modern myth making and one of the great one of the characteristic features across i think all all streams of gnosticism in antiquity is that they engaged in a rather conscious way in myth making right mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the gnostic traditions were comfortable with multiple creation stories because they recognize them as exploratory, as um, as symbolic, as sort of pointers to transcendent realities, um, as you know, introducing one to mysteries that would only be fully comprehended when once one escaped from this world. Um, and so the possibility that there could be multiple explanations for, for instance, where evil comes from, uh, a lot of Gnostic traditions were okay with that. And so it's not surprising that a Gnostic theologian in more recent times would write science fiction. Mm. Beyond that, um, I think one of the go-to one of the go-to examples is, of course, the Matrix, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's a dated example. Um, you've mentioned my blog sometimes when I've been on the show in the past. Uh, I have to mention, have to confess that I renamed my blog uh, right. not that long ago. It used to be exploring our Matrix, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now it's religion prof. Uh, part of that is because I didn't just talk about matrixy kind of things, but part of that is that that your students class... weren't born yet. <laughs> yeah, the students weren't born yet. Uh, it's it should be a classic. It's it's it's, it's a good movie. Uh, I would want to argue it's a good trilogy, even although yeah. I know some people would dispute that who uh, like the first film. But you have you have a creator that's imperfect, uh, and that ultimately is inferior in one sense at least to us and that's also a theme in Gnosticism that uh, ultimately we stem from that higher world and so there are ways in which we may be imprisoned by the the creator and uh, its henchmen but uh, we belong up there beyond this uh, the demiurge and you have these archons these sort of guardians who try to prevent people from ascending you have an illusory material world uh, of course, there's also a subversive element in the Matrix films vis-a-vis -vis Gnosticism mm -hmm. in as much as you ascend out of the Matrix and it's a pretty it's a pretty depressing scenario right. you find yourself in, right? <laughs> You're uh, not better off. And, yeah, yeah um, and so the question of whether it's better to be in an illusion that's comforting, right? And so whereas for Gnostics, there was this firm conviction, at least in ancient times, that the world that you can get to, you can ascend to, is better than this one. Uh, the Matrix kind of problematizes that. Mm -hmm. And that's because, as I think probably all science fiction, uh, even really genuinely Gnostic science fiction, uh, but all science fiction, I think, is uh, prone to be interacting with more than one tradition, mm -hmm. both religiously and theologically, but also philosophically. And in the case of The Matrix, we know that some of these things actually are conscious and deliberate on the part of the filmmakers. Right. Uh, because there's interaction not just with Gnosticism and bringing in Gnostic ideas, but there's also, uh, there's also interaction with uh, Baudrillard, right, Jean Baudrillard, mm -hmm. and his idea of um, simulacra and simulations. Uh, there's actually a moment in the original Matrix film where if you stop the movie and look and see what's that book that Neo hid this illicit software that he made in right, right uh, on a floppy disk or flash drive or whatever it is. Uh, I think back then it still was a floppy disk, wasn't it? Probably a right. floppy disk, I think yeah. it was a zip disk. Do you remember zip, zip disk? disk? Oh, yeah, <laughs> zip disk, right. Those those were around for at least um, three to six months. <laughs> a minute and a half. went out of fashion. Yeah. Um, but the book that he hides that in is Baudrillard's book, Simulacra and Simulation. Mm -hmm. And the book itself is is a fake book, right? It's hollow on the inside, he's hiding things in. And so there's these multiple levels of meaning. But Baudrillard asks the question, you know, once you can simulate something perfectly, doesn't the distinction between real and simulated lose all meaning? Mm -hmm. right. And that in itself is a fascinating philosophical question. And it's one that, you know, when philosophers want to explore it, they'll probably create a virtual world. They'll, they'll engage with science fiction, right? Uh, but religion and theology have also asked, you know, what's the nature of reality? And so uh, theology, philosophy, and science fiction all converge there once again. Mm -hmm. let's, uh, let's take a break here. When we come back, I think let's talk a little bit more about The Matrix because I think there's a lot to, uh, to discuss here. And, um, 
and and I want I want to take a kind of a, a side uh, a side road into Elon Musk a little bit. Now that we're talking about simulation, uh, I want to. I want to get into that. So, uh, everybody watching or listening along at home, stay tuned. We'll be back next week with some more with Dr. James McGrath from Butler University. <laughs>